This episode is sponsored by Furniture Box. Check them out in the description below. There are certain areas where I will say to people, I am the best in the world. Alpesh Patel, OBE. This is Alpesh Patel. Alpesh Patel. Alpesh Patel. Chief Executive of Profinium Partners. There's no difficulty to making money if making money is what you care about. This is what is off socialists. Of course it does. I was fascinated by the fact that you could have end of civilization because one man wrote a bloody book. What you got from Marx was, I want to be a capitalist. I'm really curious to know how you manage the emotional side of it. It's like, walking a tightrope and then looking down and thinking, oh, actually, I wrote to the Financial Times and said, I've got these leading traders of the world. But then I wrote to the 25 traders and said, look, the FT, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> when you write a book, you get interviewed. And CNN interviewed me. The global head of TV at Bloomberg happened to be watching CNN. And then I got a call. Would you like your own show? What I should have done in hindsight is just... What was the kind of the turning point? When my um, family moving from a state school to a private school. I could hear them discussing downstairs. They didn't know how they were going to make the school fees. I had the exact experience. That stays with you for the rest of your life. They did that. So I better do a hell of a lot more. Any moment now, I'm going to do that thing that the other pod they do on the other podcast where they start crying. So you wouldn't say you loved what you were doing then at that point? I loved it. But there's a price to pay for addiction. It's the violinist who was asked... Um, by one of the members of the audience, sir, I, I would give my life to play like you. And he turns to her and he says, madam, I do. Guys, welcome to the Ground Floor Podcast, where we are successful people exactly how they did it. Our guest today is Alpesh Patel, OBE, the founder of Prifinium Partners. Am I saying that right, Prifinium? Yeah, you couldn't get a successful person, so you got me. Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> no, with Fill the up. list of, the thing is, you say that with a list of accolades I'm about to read. I mean, this man you has You should had... see my list of failures. <laughs> but that's the, that's the way it works. We can get into that. We can oh, definitely get into boy, that. Yeah. So be a I'm therapy gonna, session. I'm literally going to have to read it. I couldn't memorize all of this because you're that good. So you're literally, so you're founder of You Prif couldn't be bothered to memorize three <laughs> How, pages of A4. Do you know, yeah, I think three whole pages. So you're the founder of Prifinium Partners, which is a hedge fund that you found and run yourself. Yeah. You are also the author of international award-winning Financial Times bestseller, Mind of a Trader, Yeah. which is a book for traders, which I really want to ask you about. Uh, you're the founder of Rootbridge Capital Investment Company. Actually, my p business partners on Prifinium founded that, so I can't take credit for it, but I am a founder. But You are listed as a founder yeah, and humble I mean, too. I'm taking credit for for actually they, they did everything nice you're also a former bloomberg tv host yes for three whole years and i loved it amazing Absolutely loved it. we're gonna touch so on many that. stories financial times columnist yes for five years weekly column about 200 columns in the ft diary of an internet trader and Oof. uh th that there's 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 a lot of stories there i can tell you as well i can tell you how much i was paid as well which is ridiculous oh, that Sons is of money <laughs> you are the perfect oh. guest someone who comes with the figures yeah, with the yeah, exposés yeah. with the dark secrets we yeah. love it you're also a board member uh, for 10 downing street entrepreneurship advisory group that, that was created many years ago and they've never sacked me so, Amazing. So it's the best way to stay on. Things. You seem shocked by that. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen? The, have you read the papers? I mean, I should say I've not done anything wrong either. But, yeah. And lastly, you're also a deal maker for the UK government Department for International Trade since 2005, and that occupies probably about 20 to 25 percent of my time. So that's that's a big chunk of my time, uh, and I can awesome. tell you more about uh, my my role as a government deal maker. Amazing. Which which is actually as sexy as it sounds it does it sound does very sound sexy good. it does i did get a bit of a tingle when you said it do you know I'm what excited to i get that. one oh, it's a good job we've got a desk I, I've there is that every time i like he's funny too do you I need to it. edit that great no no <laughs> don't worry oh, crap. Yeah, no, no, for the sake of my career yeah, no. it's your second. <laughs> forget your career this is oh. this is content oh. um but obviously uh going back to the beginning first and foremost uh which is one of the reasons why i was most excited about this is you are a trader i thought you were gonna say because i grew up in leeds that is not why. Born and raised in Leeds. But let's start there. Shout out to Leeds. Uh, yeah, uh, so people sometimes ask me, how long have you been living in the country? <laughs> think, Listen, what, are you going to report me to Suella or something? Uh, it's a suspicious question, that. But it, it, I was born in Leeds, and I love Leeds. And I said, what Leeds United? We just got relegated. So any moment now, I'm going to do that thing that the other pod they do on the other podcast where they start crying. Yeah, okay. Because we'll it, put some sad music on the last time. some That's emphasis That would be great for the trailer. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went to school in Leeds, uh, a state school and a private school. I'm still in touch with my old headmaster from the state school. And uh, uh, I also went to school in Cardiff and in India as well. But uh, yeah, Leeds and uh, no silver spoon in my mouth, I should say, uh, in a small part of Leeds called Armley, which is famous for its prison. But it, it, it's, an, it's, you know, Yorkshire people, yeah. straight talking, I know it sounds cliched, salt of the earth, honest people, just lovely. And I love going back. 
So you came out of Leeds and you ended up going to Oxford. I read philosophy, politics and economics at Oxford and I read law at King's College London. Uh, and I did an internship whilst I was at Oxford in Congress, in the US Congress, um, which was- wow. which was- That must have been interesting. Oh my God. I mean, that's that was probably the most important work I've ever done in my life. And the reason is, and so there I was affiliated with Boston University. And the reason that was probably the most important work I've ever done is because whilst I was working there for a congressman called Elliot Engel, a Democrat uh, in New York, it was 1994. Yeah, I think it was 1994. So the midterm elections were on. And he was lobbying the State Department and uh, he was lobbying the White House to have a certain country declared a terrorist state. It so ha And this is 1994. It just so happened that the brains behind 9-11, which happened obviously, as you know, in 2001, uh, was eventually found in this country in what, 2010? Osama bin Laden was assassinated in, in uh, was assassinated, was killed in in uh, in this particular country. I can name the country if you want. You might lose You might lose a few viewers, sadly. No, I wanna know what was the country. Well, so the country we were lobbying to have declared a terrorist state was Pakistan. Um, I should say, uh, the, the the first investor into my hedge fund is a dear friend of mine and is Pakistani. So it's it's not the people that I've got anything against me, thank God, because they helped me raise my hedge fund. Uh, but yeah, it was Pakistani who was having declared a, a, okay. uh, a, a terrorist state. So that was the work I was doing. I was, that must have been fascinating. So, uh, okay, uh, yeah. And uh, if you, uh, you probably don't remember this, but in, I think it was 94, around December, um, Nelson Mandela visited US Congress. So I was asked to draft the first draft, which I don't think was used, by the congressman of his sort of letter or resolution to, to welcome Nelson Mandela to the US Congress. I mean, alongside there were 500 other congressmen's letters that yeah. went in, but I got to do the first draft okay. uh, as well. And imagine you are what, in your early 20s and you get to do something like that. Yeah, It's like, and that stays, but I've still got my congressional pass and all the rest of it. I've got the letters that we wrote to the State Department. It was the Clinton White House. They didn't do any of anything regarding yeah. um, what happened uh, and then obviously you had 9 11 mm. and and so that uh, there's been a sort of a lifelong interest in anti-proliferation uh, because one of the other areas that we were working on was also saying that pakistan's a nuclear proliferator by the way just to make absolutely this is not a sort of diatribe against the people of the lovely people of pakistan uh, uh, but it was just about the politics of what was going on i could just as easily be talking about russia right now and then 10 years from now when hopefully the russians are our dearest right. friends i'd be saying oh my god did i say that about yeah, russia yeah, yeah. Sure. you know so uh, what happened is at that time uh, abdul qadir khan was a nuclear physicist in in pakistan and uh, he was a, subsequently found out to be a nuclear proliferator, uh, selling secrets to the North Koreans and the Iranians. You know, our dear friends in North Korea and Iran. Jeez. Uh, so, what? You didn't have the internet really then. You had just some talking about the internet, but it didn't exist as a thing. Uh, but what you had in the as a Congress congressional pass holder is access to the Library of Congress, which had these massive uh, digital. CDs, which had so much information that you could you know, just go on the database. And I found a little article which was written by a Financial Times journalist, funnily enough, who had interviewed A.Q. Khan, where he admitted that they had the bomb. And uh, uh, anyway, a series of events led to me uh, working with um, people who are now friends in the Indian embassy. Uh, well, they've moved on in the diplomatic service. And to make the point and amplify what Elliot Engel was doing to say, this is what goes on, mm. you know, do you guys know this? But again, the US State Department, they knew some of it, but they didn't do anywhere near yeah. as much as they should have done as they now admit many years later. And you look back on it, and you think, why don't politicians take any bloody notice? Um, so we still got all of that stuff. And and now all of that's in the in the open, you Google it and Google AQ Khan and you yeah. can see it. And the State Department regrets that they didn't do more. And there's articles about their failings and all of this. So I'm doing this work whilst I'm doing a politics degree. And of course, what I should have done in hindsight is just dropped out of university and just worked in the US Congress for congressmen mm. and legislators and become an American citizen and all the rest of it. Because so, that was phenomenal. So how do you go? I mean, that's that's obviously insane. So how do you go from that to becoming a trader? Well, I'd always been interested in trading since I was about 12 years old. I borrowed a pound from my, not a pound, a hundred pounds from my aunt. Um, I was raised by my aunts and uncles in Leeds because my parents were in India. And I borrowed a hundred pounds from her to, we used to live opposite a post office and I used to love getting all the free leaflets. I don't know why, because it was free. And in those days, it was, you know, again, no internet. 
mm. and and so I'd like, sort of read all these little booklets and they they in post offices they had stuff which was just and and this is a lesson for financial education generally they had stuff which was really easy to understand that a 12 year old could understand it because it was actually meant for the kind of people who go to post offices which are tend to be relatively older people with savings those people with savings don't exist anymore of course so i'd read this stuff and i bought some government bonds and i got some money back later and then the privatizations happened and i thought this is ridiculous i fill in a form send a check and in those days they used to they used to cash the broker would cash the whole check so yeah. if you put five thousand pounds they'd cash the whole amount even if they only gave you a thousand pounds worth of shares and then you sold the shares and you made a thousand pounds profit so your five thousand was locked for about a month but you got seven thousand back or six thousand, mm. whatever the profit element was. Sometimes you doubled your money. And how old were you at this point doing this? Twelve. So I still got the wow. documents. Okay. Um, I've still got the documents. You know, the original sort of stamps and uh, all the rest of it because I used to keep. I don't hoard as much now, but I used to keep some of that stuff. And that re the private uh, the privatizations weren't with a hundred pounds. They were with sort of by then it was like family members would be just giving me that I'd fill the forms in for them and give them the returns and obviously still favorite nephew of, of all my uncles and aunts as a result uh but um so it was power gen national power in the 90 early 90s 89 90 there was british telecom uh and then the one which didn't work out was bp which they pulled if i remember rightly and the qataris bought or q8 bought into it anyway um so it that's what got me into investing that and the fact that um, 1984, when I was 13, it was all Cold War. I mean, if you remember, you guys are, I mean, you weren't even born. Uh, but it was all Cold War stuff, and you thought the world's going to end. And there were all these films on TV. If you've never seen it, watch Threads. It'll scare the crap out of you. You'll need a nappy for weeks. I feel like uh, we're having the same thing now. I feel like now oh we're no. having the same thing. Oh, like, no, no. Really? I feel like oh a lot of people no. I speak to think the world's going to end because of AI not... and then climate change. Mate, there's a stuff. reason why the stock market in the US is at near all-time high. Yeah. This is nothing <laughs> compared to what happened in 1984. Wow. Uh, uh, where you just... And also, it didn't help George Orwell. I was about to say, book. is there anything Orwellian about that? Yeah, because written... so everyone was like, oh my God, it's really going to happen. You yeah. know? Um, so at that time, I was fascinated by the fact that you could have end of civilization because one man wrote a bloody book Karl Marx yeah and Elliot well Karl Marx and um, uh, Engels wrote Marx and Engels wrote uh, the Communist Manifesto and that led to the philosophy of communism and and, and uh, what you had in USSR so I was fascinated by uh, the the power of the pen over the sword so I thought you know what I want to do is I want to do what I'm writing because this is just power the ability to write is just incredible power mm. Uh, and the other thing was, I definitely don't want to be a worker. And you might think, what, at 12? I posted stuff like this on TikTok. And they go, yeah, 12, yeah, what, do you, what do you mean by you don't want to be a worker? What do, what do you mean? Because exactly if you read that? the Communist Manifesto, you know, works of the world unite, you've nothing to lose but your shackles. I'm thinking, wait a minute, these people are in shackles. Um, and of course, he makes the point, all valid, which is if you're an employee or if you're a worker, then you're getting paid this much. But I, as your employer, must be making more than you. Of course, the fact of the matter is when companies go bust, I'm not making more than you. You get paid before me, and it's not as simple as mm. he made it sound. Actually, yeah. we, the capitalists and the risk takers, often get screwed, and the worker keeps getting their salaries, and they can bugger off any time they want and get a job elsewhere. I'm saddled with all, all the, the losses, debt, yeah. but I'm also saddled with the rewards. Uh, so anyway, it, it, it occurred to me I want to be the capital, because capital sits on its backside and gets paid. This is what pisses off socialists of course yeah. it does or people on the left of course it does and it's there's so much injustice to the fact that just because i've got capital and worse still what if i inherit that capital mm -hmm. then i have a right to an income stream which no matter how qualified how good you are how uh, talented you are or anything else i have just got a simple advantage mm -hmm. and i start the race way ahead of you now that didn't make me think i gave a talk at eton college and they have a sister um, college that they invite and two young ladies came up to me afterwards and said so if what you got from Marx was I want to be a capitalist I said well when you put it like that you can't <laughs> showing me out and I feel really embarrassed <laughs> uh, but yeah I was 12 and I thought yeah I don't want to go down a coal mine and that's incredibly that. young to be, to yeah. be thinking about that I, I don't well I had a TRS-80 at the age of nine uh, a Tandy TRS-80 is a computer Okay. Uh, so at the age of nine and I could program in basic and then assembly by 12 I'm actually not as clever as all of that sounds because as, as, as I was discussing with my wife yesterday uh, I've met people who are really really clever you know the people who will say hey imaginary numbers in mathematics they're just so beautiful aren't they I mean 
those are really clever people i i could learn and slog and yeah. concentrate um and so at the age of 12 i don't know people say that now and i see 12 year olds who are i've got nephews and nieces who are way advanced and then others who are they're doing normal things i swear i to did used to play football and cricket and yeah. sort of be interested and, and read the beano now actually what i did is i read the beano and thought i want to start a comic because i was really interested. so with my okay. next door neighbors we started a little comic but i was the only one who was sort of doing it and then i i don't know fascinated always with content newsletters because of the power the leverage i want to ask you about what you were saying a second ago because i think that's really interesting about you know not coming from money and then wanting to be the one that has the capital and build something for yourself and so yeah. that you can you know and uh and one thing that's been on my mind quite a lot recently is i also didn't come from money but i would also like to make quite a lot of money um but the thing in my head is i don't know how i would ensure I've seen a lot of people that grew up with a lot of money because I also yeah. went to private school, but I couldn't right. afford it either. Yeah, so yeah, I've yeah. seen a lot of people that grew up with money and they're maybe not as ambitious or driven as they could be. And they yeah. do, you know, some of them do a lot of drugs, some kind of waste away. And my biggest fear is I'm the son of an immigrant and right. I, you know, don't Where have money. Where are your money. parents from? My mum, well, my mum's from a working class family in Essex. My dad was half Russian. My, my dad was Russian. I was so say, I'm, Essex I'm doesn't Russian. count as immigrant. You no, know that, don't not, you? not quite. I mean, you might feel like it. <laughs> not but, quite, no, a bit. Don't pull the Essex card out <laughs> on me and say, well, we've got it tough. Yeah, I'm, yeah. From, I'm from, it's from far, far mm. flung waters. Uh, so, well, no, my dad, my dad was Russian. So he grew up oh, in, okay. he grew up in communist Russia and then fled to, because he hated communism too. So he wanted to, you know, make a life in the capitalist West. Um, yeah. But so. Fled to UK. UK, yeah. Nice. Yeah, but so for me, my whole thing is, you know, that's my upbringing and i want to be able to make a better family for my yeah, kids and i want to go from nothing to something but yeah. then my fear is what happens when you get to the top you have all the money and then my kids are born yeah. into wealth how do you make sure they don't yeah. turn out to be my wife has this fear she dicks, goes i don't you want know? you making too much money and i'm like just stop just stop stop right there <laughs> you know let's just address the initial problem of let's make something yeah and there's always a bigger mountain to climb and then we'll worry about, yeah. oh God, what am I going to do with the private jet? You know, how am I going to spoil yeah. the, You know, we've got to make sure that, all right, worry about that. I, I, again, I did something on TikTok where I said, make a decision when you need to make the decision. Don't make it well in advance of having to. So, so, I yeah. agree, but you're, do, do you have kids? I do. I've got a five-year-old who's, who's, you're going to see him in the future on either Crime Watch <laughs> or in politics or both probably. Simultaneously. I would just be okay. <laughs> Leave that one there then. You are one of the most <laughs> individual guests that we've it's had on Friday. The show. I told and you guys, five minutes in. I said I want to. I want to do this on a Friday. Can I say what you said before you came on? Go on. Before me. he came on, he came in and he and do you want to put, 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 put the shades on? I, oh, do you want to yeah. put the shades on? He came in and he said, he said. Well, I thought, you know, I'm a trader and I sh I'm going on a podcast and, you know, hedge fund managers. You used to be a barrister. Hedge fund, yeah, I used to be a barrister, but hedge fund managers don't really do this. So I thought, I'll look at Gary Vee. He wears baseball caps. <laughs> so he's come in and sunglasses, <laughs> baseball cap and a jumper to be like Gary Vee. And, and, he's, pulling and he's pulling it off. And he's pulling it off. It's the only one I've got, <laughs> right? And the cap, I, the only one I could find, as I'd confess to you guys, was yeah. one with Lincoln's, the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn logo on it. So it's actually... A, embarrassed okay but but so bring it bring, bring it back to what i was saying before then yeah. that's not a relevant question for me because i don't have kids yet and i'm also not rich yet however mm -hmm. for you you've already done quite well for yourself and you already have a kid is it a boy or a girl it's a boy and my worry is that he's going to be a spoiled little brat but so how, so how do you what do you think yeah. about that um i try and keep him away from his mum, who is uh spoiling him right and she's gonna not watch this because she doesn't watch any of my stuff nice no she's a wonderful mother to him but mums are mums mm. are often you know they they won't discipline they'll they'll yeah. spoil yeah. and so i don't get him gifts uh i uh, for years now because if you looked at the amount of stuff he's got from family yeah it's like you know and so mm. i try and explain to him you know not everybody has money and uh, uh i mean he's only five well i say only but that's enough to understand you know explain well why is that man homeless why is he daddy why is he on the road um why are we giving him food uh why doesn't he have his own food and then rian will say actually i'm going to write to the government daddy because that's not right i said yeah good write to them and he goes well why don't his mummy and daddy give him food why doesn't he have a home and it's important he understands all this and he is and it's really important he understands that just because oh can i have those crayons even it, so we take him down to poundland my wife when he was first bought my wife would go rock up to harrods and i'm like can you just take it easy you know um and then she learned the hard way when she started getting the credit card bills that actually maybe poundland is just as good for a kid <laughs> and he doesn't know the difference he loves yeah, it exactly. he won't, he won't, i take yeah, him yeah, and i say yeah, yeah, yeah. son anything you want mom's yeah. paying 
yeah. you know, and he'll get like some crayons. Like, Can I yeah. have that? And but he knows now he can't have more than one thing, and he's got to be good and all the rest of it. Uh, and it's just making sure they understand privilege mm. and they understand that. It, it just because you want it doesn't mean you're going to get it and you can cry for it and other kids don't have all you have uh and and just trying to get that drilled in more and more and then eventually uh, i'm i'm involved with some charities hope hopefully he'll see more of that um work and you know you've got some great role models all the way from prince william trying to uh yeah prince william trying to remove uh homelessness in the mm, uk mm. to uh just regular people who we know who are supporting us i think just talking more and more about it so that mm, that concept yeah. so how do you a, yeah, how, how do you think you'd actually in, encourage that or maintain that grounding once they do go to school and get surrounded by people who do have access to that kind of money mm. as well because i think it's, yeah. it's 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 very different when they're five years old and they're with yeah. you all the time but once I, they go to school when their kids when their friends are getting bought by yeah. the trainers at yeah. 12 years old and stuff. yeah i i honestly don't know and the funny thing is you you th before you're a parent you think oh, i'll do this i'll do this and it's like that old commentary about boxing everybody's got a plan to until they get, get smacked in place, place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's going to be like that so i'll have to deal with it then but i think in anticipation of that it is to make sure he he's aware of the various mm. values um i've got friends who are stupidly rich um whose kids have a perfectly uh normal and incredibly do incredible did incredibly well at school and have gone on to be just regular responsible adults and all the rest of it i've also got friends who are stupidly rich whose kids sadly uh had drug addiction problems and so on and and what i understand now happens which didn't when i was at school is it's not just cannabis it's cocaine mm. and heroin it's 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 the class a drugs which is what i understand happens now in schools mm. which <laughs> my school that'd be i mean you know the 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 most serious thing i'm aware of at my school was somebody smoking mm. that was the, the 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 drug as it were there was none of that i mean even even when we were in school really yeah. what like class a drugs of course no. there was like, not really talking about like, were you both at the same school yeah they were yeah yeah, yeah there was loads school. of it no, there wasn't he was like out, out smoking and doing weed and stuff but other than that like doing weed yeah smoking weed whatever there's yeah, there like, was a there was right. a lot okay there was a lot which was worrying and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And that's, we know that's it. really interesting that you think that i didn't know because i didn't i never i never well obviously i didn't see it no huh like and that's just a select group of kids in our year that were doing it and yeah it wasn't like every kid was doing it but there was definitely like there was definitely a big group of but i would say don't let that limit you because my god it's hard enough to make money but if you limit it yourself and say well i'm not sure i want it now whether you believe in you know the secret and drawing things to you or whatever but i mean if you're if one it's like driving with the brakes on if one part of you is like yeah i want to be successful part of which means uh having a comfortable lifestyle uh and you've got the brakes on because the other part of you is saying actually i don't necessarily want to make it and this is a problem which happens in trading because there's people because it's the stupidest way to make money i mean it's ridiculous it's so unfair uh that you that you can make what you can make in trading and so when you increase from say i don't know a thousand pounds for argument's sake to ten thousand because you've made more and you're increasing your trade sizes uh, a lot of traders just blow up because they can't mm. handle the numbers because mm. psychologically it's a bigger step let alone other numbers which get yeah. ridiculous i spoke to a, a trader once uh who said that he knew that when he he got to a point where he was he the capital he was risking on a particular trade was two hundred and fifty thousand, mm. and at that point he was just so emotionally volatile while the trade was on and i think I that, can believe that and that one trade it, it, it was it did end up becoming profitable but it was like he was like yeah, yeah okay i had to immediately de-risk and yeah, like yeah, yeah. because i knew that my yeah. uh, my position sizing was too yeah. big even though proportionately he was still only risking one percent sure. of his portfolio yeah. but he was still like getting used to those bigger numbers yeah it's like walking a tightrope and then looking down and thinking well, actually, Look after, whoa yeah. yeah and the best thing is not to think about well you've got to be detached from it and follow a process and be emotionally removed from it and i've i mean i've come home some days and said to Ekta, okay yeah she'll say i want to throw a party with me i said well we make this much she goes what i said and she goes can you do that every day and i said no because i'm gonna have a bloody heart attack by the end of the yeah. week if i keep doing it like yeah. that it's so intense how yeah. do you how do you manage that i'm really curious to know how you manage the emotional side of it because i think bo both of us went through a period of doing trading ourselves yeah. and had very different experiences with it as i'm sure everyone does when they're when yeah. they're trying it out and emotional intelligence and emotional control are some of the hardest things to to really actually maintain when, well, you, when you're doing it so what advice do you have that's why that the front? book that's why the first book 
uh, was called The Mind of a Trader. It was about the mind because I realized that was, and the subtitle was Lessons in Trading Strategy from the World's Leading Traders. So the strategy part was secondary to the mind. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the question I asked because I didn't know the answers. And the funny thing was, when I, I was interviewing them when I was working across the road at Gray's Inn Square when I was a barrister. So I would interview these traders because I knew I wanted to leave the law to trade full time. And people like Bill Lipschitz, uh, 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 Ben Adopity, David Kite. Uh, and I'd ask them, so how do you manage all of that emotional, the, the mental side? And what surprised me, and this is an important lesson, I think, for everyone. It's been, I'm, I was very lucky I met them when I did, when I was in my uh, 20s, because it allowed me to shape the rest of my life. One of them just passed away about 10 days ago, and they had an obituary in the Financial Times. And every single one of them taught me some important life lessons, which are, you can take these, if you read a book, you take some stuff on, you know, it doesn't usually really impact most people. It impacts about 1% of people and some become fanatical, whatever the book is, uh, or extremist or whatever. It, but it isn't really for the rest of us. You know, we don't go around reading books and suddenly become, all right, I'm going to go to an ashram or, you know, join ISIS or something. Um, but when you meet people, there's a bigger influence. And so I had the for uh, good fortune of meeting these people and actually seeing you know, the whites of their eyes and mm. they're explaining to me. Yeah, I was going to say, how did you meet Bill Lipschitz? So what I did And by is, the way, for anyone listening, do you want to just give a quick clarifier? Yeah, so Bill is? Lipschitz was global head of foreign exchange trading at Salomon Brothers. His boss, ultimate boss, would have been Warren Buffett at some stage because Warren Buffett was chairman of Salomon's. And Salomon's were probably the biggest Forex bank in the world at the time. So this guy was probably the biggest Forex trader in the world. And he was... Uh, he then left to set up his own hedge fund. He was hedge fund manager of the year uh, about four or five years ago. So I met him uh, when I shortly after I left the U.S. Congress. So uh, about ninety five, ninety six, and uh, the, okay, sneaky bad way that I met him. But you know, this was the hustle. I wrote to the Financial Times. Actually, I wrote to twenty five different publishers and said, "I've got these." leading traders of the world who have agreed to be interviewed and I gave them a list of about 25 uh, if you agree to publish the book and 24 publishers rejected me and the 24th one which I think was University of Manchester Press and you know um, uh, said to me try Richard Stagg at the Financial Times at FT Publishing so I tried Richard and Richard said yeah we like that then I wrote to the 25 traders and said, look, the FT, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and that. I said to Richard, I said, Richard, um, can I, just to reinvigorate their enthusiasm, can I use FT headed paper? And he said, yeah, it's fine. Give me a little what of FT paper. Because oh, really? okay. obviously by That's, then I was I love technically that. contracted to and right yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. From, yeah. So I got this and I wrote to them. And I got people like Bill and so on. And uh, they all agreed because it was going to be an FT book. Uh, and I've still got the, I think I've still got the acceptance letter and the contracts from the Financial Times and all of this. And and Richard is still there. Is is at FT Publishing, and I should get it. Essentially, it's July. It's his birthday soon, uh, and that was life altering. And um, there are certain things in your life which you look back and you think, like the OBE, like the book, like Congress, this has changed my life forever. Mm. Um, and that was one of them mm. because then uh, I came back. That book became a great seller for them it's translates in many languages and then richard said to me you're out in washington and you keep talking to me about this internet thing and it's coming over here in the uk so we're talking circa 97 now and i said yeah i'm all over it i said you know i fell in love with it when i was in the us and i did and i had bought loads of books and all the rest of it and i was lucky because i had a laptop with a modem and i never knew what the hell that modem thing was for i mean i sort of knew but who used it uh when i was in washington so i plugged it in one day and and it talked back to you on CompuServe and all of this. So I said to Richard, yeah, I can write a book about trading online. And that became a huge international bestseller. And this is the Forrest Gump part of your life. And this is where it's really important you guys know so much of things which you would call success are down to luck. And speaking as somebody who's a lot older, I can tell you how true that bloody is. And it's annoying that it is. Because when I was then, when you write a book, you get interviewed for TV often. And CNN interviewed me. And the global head of TV at Bloomberg happened to be watching CNN and said, look, we'd like to call you in for a Bloomberg to interview you about the book. So did the interview. And then I got a call uh, and they said, would you like your own show? 
I mean, literally that. Who yeah. the hell, when does that happen? Catherine Oliver, she subsequently went on, to, she was global head of TV at Bloomberg, and she went on to um, be head of New York uh, Film Commission. So all those films you see, that was down to her. And now she works for, still for Michael Bloomberg in Bloomberg Philanthropies or Bloomberg Cities, you know, their sort of city project to improve yeah. cities around the world. So K KO, as we called her. Um, that was down to her. Do you think you make your own luck, though, to an extent? Well, yes, there is a degree. So of luck, I discussed but, you know. this in the book um, with the traders because trading, they'd say, you know, very often it's amazing how often they say it came down to luck. And what they meant is, if you got ten trades, and if a trend happens to hit, you can't move the market, mm, you can't yeah. foresee the future, you don't have a crystal ball. But if your trend following and that trend hits, and you make a load of money, that was luck. But if you weren't in the market, then you weren't going to get that luck. Mm -hmm. So you sort of had to, the way I likened it in the book was, which is a really bad analogy or metaphor was, um, if you want to get hit by the truck of luck, you have to be trying to cross the road, which I don't know why I thought of such a, I mean, so otherwise it's a really good book. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and there was a hell of a lot of luck. She happened to watch it. And, yeah. and that's the period of my life. I was like 29 and I used to get these sort of, not premonitions, but really strong feelings, things were gonna happen, certain things were gonna happen. And so the book, the book, the column in the newspaper and the Bloomberg TV thing happened on the same day uh, when I was 29. And it was July the 16th. And that happens to be my birthday. Wow. And you can't make that up. No, that's a twist of fate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that you know what I mean? It's crazy. like, okay, so, and then you're saying, you're calling up your parents and your grandma and you're saying, I'm going to have a column in the Financial Times and I'm going to have my own TV show. <laughs> what? You yeah. know, and in finance. And Bloomberg was and is the place to be if you want to sure. do financial yeah, TV. Of course. I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Financial Times is the the publisher to have and, and, mm. the, and the column and all the rest of it. So there was an element of luck, but it was also, I could see the internet thing's gonna be huge. Now, mm. people watching this are gonna be thinking, yeah, mate, you were in America, you thought the internet was gonna be huge, but you weren't smart enough to go to Silicon Valley and create a multi-trillion dollar company. Exactly. So I'm a little bit clever, but I'm not, you know, founder of Google clever, founder yeah. of Microsoft clever, mm. not, not, he's nodding, mate. <laughs> What the hell? You don't have to agree when I'm saying. You're meant to go, no, no, no. I'll Shout out <laughs> what Producer the Barney. Heck? Um, what the heck? Producer Barney keeping it real. He hasn't even got a pass. I you, don't even think he's part there, of the team. There is, you're, go on. No, no. I was, I was going to say that there is an element of, of you putting yourself. You've got to go out there. Exactly. Yeah, you've got to put yourself in that position. No, like, you know, of, but of, you've got of, to go out there. And the people who say, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to put myself out there. And that today, that means social media. Sure. And my team, and my my wife's team. My wife is global head of venture capital for the UK government, and she has a team of people under her. And she goes, "Why are they not on social media? The government wants them mm. to be on social media." Uh, and it was the time when civil servants would never be obviously public facing, and now it's like, no, you've got to be public mm. facing. And if you don't put yourself out there, and and people, I mean, look, I wouldn't have had this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows what's going to happen off the back of this? Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay. I had Business Insider do a whole profile on me. I don't like profiles because I've had them done before and they're fine. It's just that it's like, wait a minute, who do you think you are? Kind of thing. And, right. and until I've got, you know, the 17 private jets and, you know, it's a bit much saying. Still wow. stuck at 15, can't get past the 15th well, jet. You know, it's, it's like there's there's a lot of bigger fish, you yeah, know, yeah, let's yeah. be honest. And so it, it the, the sort of, but they actually did the profile more on the AI part and how I'm using it. So that was fine because it wasn't really about me. It was yeah. about that and more, which is more important. Um, so similarly with this, you, yeah, you've got to put yourself out there and you never know what's going to come off the back of it. Now, some people like me get foolish Forrest Gump luck and they get their own newspaper columns and their TV programs. Mm that element of luck doesn't normally happen where you win the lottery and make no mistake since then i can point to a thousand things where actually people say they turn around and say to me hey you know you won the competition and i won a competition in the ft afterwards as well where i beat all the other sort of brokers bankers analysts fund managers and to forecast the markets over a 12-month period and that's pretty difficult to do i came within 0.5 percent of the the correct value based on analysis and they said you must be able to raise billions I said, yeah, I wish. I go in after Goldman Sachs when we're capital raising and go in go in before JP Morgan. Mm. Guess who they're gonna give the money to? Mm. And they gave it to Neil Woodford. <laughs> I actually beat him in the competition. Okay. They subsequently went on. He came fifteenth. They had the editor's cat random number picking. <laughs> Woodford matched the cat. Really? Okay. If people don't know who Neil Woodford is, Google him. 
So they, a, they went so, in them particularly well. But so a cat performed as well as well which is no surprise because that was 2004 by 2016 17 or 18 he was apologizing publicly in the press for being rubbish it took the market the sum total of the cleverest people in the world and all their money it took them 14 years mm. to work out um, maybe we should have given the money to either the cat or alpesh <laughs> but they didn't give me the billion. Hey guys, I just wanted to take a second to talk about our sponsor for this episode, Furniture Box. Furniture Box is an online furniture retailer that makes awesome products for everywhere from your bedroom to your office. Now we actually had Monty and Dan, the co-founders on our show, that's how we met. We loved their story and we hung out with them afterwards and we knew that we wanted to work with them. And here's the thing, one of the biggest issues I have whenever I've ordered furniture in the past is that certain big name furniture companies, not naming any names, will charge you a fairly large fee for delivery and even then that delivery usually takes a few days, if not longer. With Furniture Box, not only do they offer free next day delivery, but they're now planning on extending their delivery cutoff even more so that you can literally order a dining set as late as 8 p.m. and be eating dinner on it the next day. So to put it simply, there's no one in the UK furniture scene that's doing anything like what they're doing, and we're thrilled to have them as our sponsor. So click the link in the description and check them out. Now back to the episode. I think there's something to be said for like, there's obviously, yes, a significant degree of luck in a lot of these things and you are very humble. And networks. And and networks, which we, I, I, which we will get onto. But I do also think credit where credit is due. I've never seen someone in the public eye or that seems to have achieved a certain degree of success that has been just lucky. You can't be lucky for no. 10 years or 20 years. Um, you know, you can have luck sprinkled throughout 10, 20 years. You can't make the no, kind of career I, you've I, had I just am, with luck. I, uh, there are certain areas where I will say to people, I am the best in the world at this particular thing. There what are very would that few be? of those. What would that be? Um, I would say when I was writing my Financial Times columns, if you can find anybody else who has written columns about trading and investing which are better than those, uh, I'll argue with you that you're wrong and I'll point out why you're wrong about it. I think those are the best articles on. And by the way, and I'll tell you why, and okay, well, how do you prove that, Alpesh? Uh, so there were, in particular, I would share with the public the, the cutting edge research that was coming out, make it into understandable format. Three particular economists that I used to find their research, share it with people and, and do that level of, I, I used to do all night, I'd pull about 24 hours of just research and then write the column and submit it by about 8 a.m. the next day. So from 8 a.m. the previous day and submit the column at 8 a.m. to the 8 a.m. It was killing me uh, because it was filed every Tuesday and it was just killing me on the Mondays and, and Tuesdays to finish. and. The, the Richard Thaler, Daniel Kahneman, and Eugene Famer were the just nobody had heard of them back in two thousand. I was going to say they have some writing. pretty big names now. Yeah, but not in two thousand. Mm. And their work, I would share on there. Nobody had heard of it. They all three went on to win the Nobel Prize in economics, not because of my mm. column, obviously. Uh, <laughs> there's an element of credit taking I just can't go beyond. But it was that level of research and quality information expressed in simple terms that people loved. I've got mm. people who are in my industry uh, and out of it who'd still meet me and say, I used to buy the paper just for your column. I thought, great. And the other way I know is because it was the most expensive real estate in the FT, because mm. the FT told me. They said, we have your column and then we have three blocks for adverts next to it, because that commands the highest payment mm -hmm. for us. Uh, you you put out uh, Mind of a Trader in 1997. Yeah. But what's interesting is, so the book that's often considered, you know, the trading Bible, which mm. is Market Wizards by Jack D. Schwager. Um, yeah, I met Jack Schwager. Okay, so I want to ask you about that. But yeah. just before you, I do, yeah. um, that came out in 1989. So I sort of copied his idea. I was about to say, well, not copied, but as in like, were you were you quite heavily inspired by it? I'm guessing yeah. you read Market Wizards by that. Because yeah, that Market yeah. Wizards, nothing had ever happened like that. No, no, absolutely. Like ever. And it's an amazing book. Um, it's a great book. And I'd have to say, if somebody said to me on that, I think his book's better than mine. Um, so just so you know, there are a limited number of things in which I think I'm the absolute best at. Um, th that's one. I think that the software that I've created in terms of helping people invest in the market, not just from the returns I've seen, what the people get, and the fact that it removes all these intermediaries, I think that's the best in the world. Both in terms of output, result, cost, value, quality, all the rest of it. And we can, yeah. I can explain that later. But yeah, so with Jack Schrager, um, I was in my 20s, and one thing that I knew is if something's big in America, you can probably nick it and bring it here. And trend following stealing. I mean, trend following is just mm. following somebody else's trend. 
so I also wanted to ask you about... So I copied his idea, but yeah, then okay. Richard said to me at the publisher, he said, no, don't do it in Q&A format, which is what he did. He'd ask a question and then put the answer. He said, do it in prose, which is a hell of a lot more hard work. Uh, a heck of a lot more hard work. So I then had to convert it into prose, mm -hmm. and I do about 10,000 words a day. Uh, I think the book is about 80,000. I, mean, I just remember at the time, just being at my computer, I'd have the markets on in one window, and a separate window with just the book, and, and just because yeah. the markets don't normally do much, and so you're just working, working, working. And I remember just working. I, I probably spent my 20s and 30s working seven days a week. And I think I remember once, and it was wrong to do so, because it'll ruin your life, um, and, and you'll put on a lot of weight. Uh, uh, I, I remember once, it was a Sunday afternoon, it was 4 p.m., and I I said to myself, oh, I've got an hour off. I was so excited. Mm. That's wrong. So there is a price you pay for all of this. So you wouldn't say you loved what you were doing then at that point? I loved it. But there's a price to pay for addiction, um, an obsession. Mm. And um, and by the way, 1999, well, the, the premonitions that I used to get, not premonitions, these strong feelings I get, I remember saying to my grandmother, I said, I think I'm going to be asked to do something in government. This is where it gets spooky. Uh, I think I'm going to get a letter from the Prime Minister. This was the time where I could think of something and it would happen. It's nuts. Do you believe in the secret? I don't know. I mean, there's there's people who've got incredibly successful lives who believe in it. Um, I was gobsmacked when I saw um, Oprah Winfrey believed in it and, you know, it happens. I think what it is is, whether you believe in that part or not, it's the fact that whatever you're thinking about, constantly it's not that you necessarily make i can think all the time about losing weight but mm. it's not gonna happen unless i move my ass it's the fact that you end up doing something about what you're obsessed about so if you're obsessed about mm. i mean i think it's from citizen kane um uh where he says it's a fantastic line he goes there's no secret to make uh, there's, there's no difficulty to making money if making money is what you care about and it's that point of the obsession uh i soon discovered making money wasn't what i was obsessed about uh, in actual fact, and as a as a friend of mine once put it, a former MP put it, he says, you don't actually have the greed gene. And I don't, because I wasn't raised that way. My family actually were in business. They were all in business. My dad floated a company on the Mumbai Stock Exchange, even though he left school at 16 with no qualifications. Um, and my uncles and aunts, they had a, a business in nightclubs and hotels in the north of England. There weren't many teetotal Gujaratis who had probably one of the most popular nightclubs uh, orbit for those who know it uh in and you'd have queues around the block so i saw what success real success looks like you know your dad's building a factory and you're sort of yeah. there looking at it going that's a real thing i mean the stuff i do is all ethereal it's it's not really there well, i buy shares in apple i didn't invent apple and then i sell it for a bit more later as, as some of my tiktok followers will say that makes me a parasite mm, i don't go that far um <laughs> Uh, uh, and others would say, well, you haven't invented or created anything, and you're absolutely right. It's completely worthless activity. Totally, unless you do something with that money. Yeah. But what's interesting is, you know, that whole thing about... Oh, sorry, so I got the letter from the Prime Minister. Okay. In 99, and right. they asked me to be on the UK-India Roundtable to advise on bilateral, closer bilateral ties. Yeah. Alongside some very big names. Um, so Lord Paul was chairing it, and on the Indian side, they had Uday Kotak, who is a billionaire now, and um, Hamendra Kotari, who is ridiculously wealthy as well and and so on and i thought how the hell have they got me i was the youngest one on there 29 but it happened i thought mm. oh, it happened i don't get it and ever since then i've been involved in government you, you mentioned about not having the greed gene um but if i remember correctly you said you were quite heavily inspired by ed sokota the trader who i think i believe he turned five thousand dollars into 15 yeah. million did you watch yesterday's webinar uh i watched some of it because i mentioned that's, it yesterday that's, that's what that's what i was looking and at I yeah, that's where i got um, it from by all of them it was so initially and when you, you said by the way which is interesting is that you were quite open about the fact that you were like it it was let's be completely honest cut the shit it was about the money i saw that and i yeah. was like i want that money yeah when you're in your 20s and then you realize as you progress that actually this is it's a bit like this i want to lose 10 kilos i'm probably going to lose about three work really hard and now i'm going to think oh my god to lose the next seven <laughs> it's too difficult let's just call it a day about losing three because it's just getting too hard mm. and to me that's what happened so initially it was like yeah i love this oh look i've got a bit of money um there's a recent research study showing that what makes people feel that they're rich and i think it was charles schwab that did it and it, they said that for 75 percent of people it was like a couple of hundred grand in the bank which most people wouldn't consider rich if you ask them on a blank sheet of paper mm. but actually it made them feel 
rich because, and if you've read Four Hour, was it Four Hour Week? Four Hour Work, work week. week. Four Hour Work Week, which is a phenomenal book. Uh, it shows you how you you know you do your easy jet flights uh, and all the rest of it. And you've actually, oh, you do it Uber, there's your chauffeur. Okay, um, cleaners, you can get 10 pounds an hour. Mm. So now you've got a maid. Um, if I can get my son to fold my clothes, I've got a valet. <laughs> Uh, but you get my point. You can. Yeah, yeah. You you don't actually need as much as you think you do, and then you decide. Well, actually, do I want that much more, or do I just want to actually go into the office at ten because I can then drop my son to school or play with him in the mornings and get home at five so I can play with him in the evenings? Which which are those two things, or do I want to raise another fund and go travel to Luxembourg every other or Switzerland or? Dubai or whatever, um, raising capital and being away from home. That's what I mean by lacking the greed gene. Mm. That was greed. So there was necessity, bare mm. minimum. I used to sit at the top of the stairs. When my um, family moved me from a state school to a private school uh, when I was 13, I spent more years in a state school, by the way. Uh, I could hear them at the from the top of the stairs. I'd listen, and the door would be closed, but I could hear them discussing downstairs they didn't know how they were going to make the school fees i had the same i had the exact same experience that changes you yeah mm. especially when you're young mm. that stays with you for the rest of your life um that's how you do the 4 amers and i have a test for people when they say they want something it's the 4 a.m test are you willing to work till 4 a.m for it or are you willing to get up at 4 a.m for it mm. and do you have that natural amb ambition obsession for it i had as a civil servant friend of mine who just recently retired from the civil service put it you've got this guilt I, he calls it guilt. I don't think it's guilt. I think it's there's a uh, a, a debt of honor that they did that. Mm -hmm. So I better do a hell of a lot more mm. to repay them back. That's I exactly can see it in I your feel. eyes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Welling up, can, mate. Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be me who's welling up. <laughs> yeah, not meant to well, be you. It's, yeah, it's that. It's that. But that's thing. what it does, and mm. it gets you through times. And there are times when you need that. You need to dig deep into that, and you say, no, they did this. I am not failing. I am not giving up, no matter what. I'm not mm. giving up because they didn't and they had character. I must have some of what they've got. And mm -hmm. that's what you do and you need it. And wherever you get it from, you've got to dig deep into it because life does have the habit of kicking you in the teeth. What was, I, the, what was the kind of the turning point for you and how did you actually switch off that, I suppose, switch off that gene within you to, I suppose, choose a life of balance over money? Yeah, well, it, when it was unbalanced for a long period of time, what actually happened was I stayed unbalanced throughout my 30s but what was happening was when you've got a column in the ft and you've got your own tv show and you've got international best-selling books and you're being flown out to guatemala to give talks you know business class i think first time i flew business class i was about 28 i was like oh my god i'm flying business class wow and they paid for it and all the rest of it um i think it was pan am which still existed back then pretty sure it was pan am anyway uh and i, I was gobsmacked and when you've got all of this and when you're on the UK India roundtable uh, with the government you've got um, in in India you had armed guards and police outriders wherever you're going it wasn't because of me it was because actually the the Indian co-chair was working on issues around Kashmir so it was actually security for him but you felt great you've got all these police cars and stuff and it was like all this VIP treatment and you're in your early 30s never mind my kids I was thinking wait a minute how do i stay grounded because i'm from yorkshire uh and there was some there was a couple of things i learned which i'll tell you in a second so that was one thing but you 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 get people pulling you in different directions mm. good and bad i subsequently discovered so some things were good that were pulling in there were some people who were bad who want to you know they want to get their nails into you and and, and take money out of you and have you basically take money off you so what happened is that was still imbalanced, but I could do those other things because I thought, oh, wow, if I was just greedy, I'd be focused. Mm. And I'd just say, no, all I'm going to do is trade, 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 leave me alone because that's all I'd been doing. Mm -hmm. Then it was like, oh, no, I want to do a bit of this government stuff. I want to do a bit of this one. So I, had, I was like a kid in a cookie shop. It was like a toy shop or a sweet shop. I was like, oh, I can do this and do this. And so the, the lessons for grounding that I learned was it was never about me. Nobody, whether it was new friends or... Uh, 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 or the police outriders was because of me. It was because of the seat I was in, the chair I was in. I was representing the UK, or uh, I had a certain title, and it was because of the office of the title. It wasn't to do with, oh, that's Alpesh, let's get to know him. Nobody gave a damn really about that. So that kept you grounded. And I discussed this with 
somebody who became a dear friend of mine, um, who's now passed away, who was the chairman of the London Metal Exchange, Lord Bagri. And I said to him, you know, Uncle, I, because Indians call him Uncle, I said, do you know, Uncle, I realized early on, I asked him, how did you do the same? You know, how did you, because he became chairman of the London Metal Exchange, how do you keep that distance uh, from, you know, it's not you and keep that ego in check? And I would just say to myself, it's it's not me. It's not me that they're interested in. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that there's probably a fair number of people watching that would like to become a trader. Yeah. Um, and, I, and so I want to pivot back to trading for a little bit because yeah. I think that that's uh, trading has had a massive boom in, in the kind of media space over the past kind of five, 10 years. It's much more kind of. Well, prominent. I wrote Trading Online in 1998 and it became mm. an international bestseller translated into a multiple uh, into a multitude of languages. So it, it's for you young folk, it's a new big thing. For yeah. us, it's been around for ages. But I think because it's a lot of, more accessible now. Yeah, think, because of the proliferation of, of social media and you know, you've got a yeah. lot of like Forex gurus and all this kind of thing. And you know, you've got the so whole, much fraud going on. You've got a lot there. of yeah. fraud. We never yeah. had to deal with that. Yeah. So, but what I wanted to ask is so, um, because I've, I've had a passion for trading for, for a very yeah. long time. Um, and actually, funnily enough, the thing that got me into trading was actually Richard Dennis which yeah. was the turtle turtles. traders the turtles i read the complete i, well, I yeah. read the market wizards and then yeah. i read the um i read the interview with richard and yeah. i was like that's fascinating and then yeah, i and then i read problem. the complete turtle trader yeah and it was basically from that doesn't know it's a book about um richard dennis one of the greatest traders of all time him and one of his business partners had an experiment where they took i think it was 12 or a class of 10 yeah, individuals like uh, yeah. people who weren't traders basically um taught School them their system teachers and the like yeah anyone you had to be uh, vaguely proficient at maths they gave them certain maths questions um but other than that they basically took 10 people who were not traders and turn them into multi-millionaire professionals. Which is a bit like the film Trading Places. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. like that. Um, but it was a real thing. And uh, and so that was hugely inspiring yeah. because I was never super mathsy. Yeah. Um, you don't need to be super math. Not now, especially. Not now, especially. Yeah. Um, but I was always like, I love the idea that you could be a regular person and learn yeah. to do this thing. It's like that, learning to that drive. That's the analogy very, I give. You know, yeah, exactly. It's so um, what was your thoughts on the turtles, first of all? Well, it was again one of the things which I came across later and thought because I one one thing that I did when I wanted to um, trade full time, so I left being a barrister to trade full time because when I was there across the road, I would often I can confess now uh, because there's nothing they can do about it, uh, but I'd often get my sort of work done as it were, go to the library, Gray's Inn Library, and just be calling because at that time it was just phones calling Charles Schwab because they were my brokers. Um, and their options desk and say, look, I want to buy these. What's the price on these yeah. calls? What's the what's the price now? What's the price now? I used to, f they used to be so fed up. And I remember once I placed an order, a call order on, I don't know, um, AstraZeneca, 180 calls. You know, I'd like to buy three at 15 or whatever. And I could hear them on the floor of the whatever it was, Chicago Board Options Exchange, wherever they were trading it at the time. And I could hear the line from the broker to the floor trader and the floor trader. And somebody shouting back, going whoa big spender and i thought <laughs> <laughs> i started calling them a lot less then <laughs> yeah uh because i was just you know i was a pupil um i earned six thousand pounds in a whole year as a pupil as a pupil barrister you earned nothing in those days so i didn't have the money i was I felt a bit embarrassed well, all right i'll show you um but i would read every book i could get my hands on mm -hmm. so if you looked at my bookshelves back then they just had every single possible book uh, because I love trade, and that's what I mean by obsession. Mm -hmm. Whatever your obsession, if you've not got that level, and then you come back to me and say, "Oh, this is really difficult," I'm like, "Well, you don't really look like somebody who wants to master their craft and is obsessed with it." Mm -hmm. And I was obsessed. I mean, I can to this day, you know, I can name you all the Japanese candle formations. I used to read the. I'd go on holiday, so I'd be in a pool on holiday, and in the pool, that would be my reading list. Mm -hmm. I'd be reading the Meta Stock Manual because I wanted to know all the bits that can happen. Now that's not right. That's something wrong with you. you know? I don't know though, because I, I, again, I, I relate to that. Yeah. I find that when I'm when I'm away on holiday, I said this to my friend literally yesterday, I just got back from a holiday and it was great. I should tell I don't do that anymore. But I don't I, need to. But I yeah. think being in my 20s, I've, I'm, yeah. I've still got that hunger of like, yeah. you know, you're not there yet. And you, I'm yeah. like, after Good. after a couple of days of being yeah. away, I'm kind of like, all right, I'm ready to get back to it now. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? There's a picture which I think it was Schwab or somebody used where I'm on a beach in Nice and I'm not kidding, um, a friend took it. Um, he's now actually really, really senior at Pictet. Uh, she's one of the most senior people at Pictet. They just made him, um, there's been more American presidents than there've been partners 
equity partners at Pictet, it's really? that way. Right. Yeah, wow, and he's okay. just become an equity partner there. And uh, he took the picture, and I'm on a beach in Nice, and he um, and I've got the FT. <laughs> And I'm reading the FT on a beach in Nice because yeah. the options prices were on okay. and I just wanted to see yeah. some of the trends and all the rest. And he took a picture. And then Schwab or somebody used it. They said, oh, can we use this for an article they wanted me to write? And I wrote the article and I gave him this picture. And they said, that's great. We'll use that. Um, so that's obsession. Do you think... And I most people would say, thanks, mate, but no thanks. Mm. I thought about going to politics and realized I don't have that obsession so why would i do it but i think it's also cancelling out your options though isn't it at that point it's like it's finding out what you're obsessed with and then mm. focusing yeah, if you're on lucky enough to find down. something but that's to do that comes back with trying i that feel like that's trying tasting a lot of different things yeah and self-knowledge yeah and you know that the the japanese thing where they say you know if it's something which you can enjoy and makes you money uh and hopefully has a bigger purpose yeah and we're trading the bigger purpose because Ikigai. what you can do with the money yeah, yeah exactly then if you can uh, if you get the middle of those three circles, now how do you find that? And then mm. people look at this and go, oh, people are so lucky you find it. No, mm. no. It, it, it's the violinist who was asked um, by one of the members of the audience, sir, I, I would give my life to play like you. And he turns to her and he says, madam, I did. If you're not willing to do that, then no, it's not that I'm lucky because I can mm. tell you the cost, it's a cop the personal people, cost. Though. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to live 20 years less because my health was buggered up by the amount of hours I've spent in my 20s and 30s. Maybe I, well, I know, I mean, the, a lot of the bad stuff that happened to me in my life was because it wasn't balanced and all the rest of it. Hey guys, this interview was so powerful. It actually ran for about two hours. So we're dropping the second half of this interview next week, which specifically drills in on his focus on trading and all of the valuable lessons that he's learned in the trading community and all the lessons he can teach you if you are interested in trading. So if you don't wanna miss that, make sure to subscribe. That will be dropping next week and uh, we'll see you there.